Hey guys, this is Toby Mathis. And Jeff Webb. And you're listening to Tax Tuesdays, where we are bringing tax knowledge to the masses. That was tax knowledge to the masses. It sounded more like a, something else. <laughs> um, first off, let's get everybody in here. And in the question and answer feature, just let me know how you guys are doing. Somebody says, I'm in Cancun, heading to dinner, so we'll listen to the replay. Have fun. That's just like rubbing sand in our pants. <laughs> um, no, you have a good time. Everybody's doing good. When was the last time somebody said, how are you really doing? <laughs> I'll say that to everybody. How are you really doing? <laughs> just don't watch the news. Not as good as the Cal Cancun folks. I don't know. Cancun could be horrible, right? We'll just say that because maybe you drink too much. You might have too much fun. Get sunburn. Yeah, you get sunburn. Yeah, awesome sauce. Weather in Florida is cool. Cold in Florida. Everybody says it's cold. Got a lot of folks from all over the place. Thank goodness. Look at that here in Wyoming. We usually ask in the other ones where everybody's from. But there's, we usually have like 10,000 people registered for these ones, which, by the way, snowing in Alaska. Look at that. I'm kind of jealous of that. Aloha from Maui. No, I'm really jealous of that. Los Gatos, you're locked down. Someone don't leave the house. They'll come get you. Honolulu. Oh, man, I'd like to be in Honolulu. I'd like to be in Maui and Honolulu. Did you see Hawaii is uh, offering free airfare if you work there remotely for at least 30 days? There's a there's a little thing that they make. <laughs> there's a catch to that. I was like, oh, I'll go. They were like, uh, you have to apply for it. And then they're going to do 100. They're just mean. Seattle's raining. Well, I hear you. I lived there for 25 years. Somebody says Maui. That's yeah, overrated, too. Yeah. There's Mark from Hawaii. Iceland is allowing you to work there remotely for six months. <laughs> <laughs> everybody's don't be hating on the Hawaii people, by the way, it's really tough living on paradise, Chile and Slidell. You live in Slidell. It's where my brother and, and his wife live. Pompano beach, Slidell, Louisiana. He always goes to Mississippi. I know. Look at this <laughs> now. All right. Now everybody's asking me as a real estate professional, can my capital gain from a sale of a rental avoid net investment income tax? Uh, if you're a real estate professional, I don't think it's going to impact your um, income, but I'm not 100% certain. Uh, yeah. If you sell that rental, it's still going to be capital gain. It doesn't. The real estate professional doesn't change the nature of the gain or loss when you sell. Right. Not on the sale, but on your real estate loss, it'll allow it to be ordinary. Yeah. On your income, it's still considered passive. But uh, certain types, like I think S Corp income, when it comes through there, you're not going to be subject to it. But uh, I don't think that you get to avoid that. Somebody says it's perfect driving. Net and income, uh, net investment income tax is the extra 3.8 percent on uh, passive income sources, rents, royalties, dividends, interest, capital gains that comes yeah. after you after you're above. Two hundred thousand dollars single, two fifty. Gosh, my brain's already hurt. Yeah, it's it's like a two factor calculation, so you can fall into that in a couple different ways. Mm -hmm. Look at this. My PowerPoint's deciding it doesn't want to work. Oh, uh, let's call it a day. I know this is weird. My computer's been doing weird things. Uh, it doesn't want to work. Look at that. I may have to come out of this and and, and restart it. So I'm going to ask Patty or, or I can't even see you guys. I'm going to have to crash my computer and restart it. Well, guys, we can talk about next year, can't we, Susan? We can. Why don't we tell about next year's landing page for them? 
So next year, as of January uh, 2021, we are going to be moving this webinar over to the Zoom platform so we can accommodate more people on our calls because we've uh, pretty much reached capacity with GoToWebinar. So uh, keep an eye out for an email uh, closer to the end of the year, probably about a week or two before uh, the first episode of January for a new registration link. And uh, we hope you guys will continue to join us. Yes, so you have to make sure you have to register for the new link or else you will not get one. So make sure you see that in your inbox and to uh, register via that way. Correct, Susan? Absolutely. That's correct. Perfect. I'm just enjoying listening to you guys. I don't know if you're <laughs> curious now, but... Uh, Welcome down. back, Toby. Next year. Are we back? You yeah. are back. Yeah, just we, I'm going to write uh, Bill a, a thank you letter for giving me this wonderful, <laughs> whatever this thing's been doing to me the last few days. It's been absolutely joyous. So uh, there we go. There we go. Yay. I think it's working again. So uh, I'm going to blame it on uh, PowerPoint. So we have a lot of questions to go through. I'm not going to pontificate anymore because hopefully my PowerPoint is now working. There we go. It's always fun when things crash. Sorry, guys. And thanks, team, for jumping in and saving that one. I did not want to cancel this thing out. I didn't want to accidentally turn everybody off. So let's get back in. Zoom is much better. We are going to Zoom so that we don't have these sorts of wonderful things happen. I can't blame really GoToMeeting for this, but let's just blame GoToMeeting. No, I think so. Uh, Tax Tuesday rules asked live. We'll answer before the end of the webinar. Send in questions at tax tuesday at andersonadvisors.com if you need a detailed response you'll be uh we'll give you one but if you want a really detailed like that pertains to you the you need to become a client this is fast fun and educational uh we want to help give back and educate a bunch of questions are coming through before i forget uh, get the cat you might know what's going on you guys mean have you guys seen my cats uh, I'll have to give you guys uh, show you pictures one day. Uh, let's see. I guess we will agree to disagree, Dan. I think that it should follow the rental income as being active, not passive. The rental income. Oh, yeah. So the rental income. So we're talking about capital gains. So, Wayne, they were discussing the capital gains on it. So net investment income taxes. I don't think it's going to be on rents necessarily. Yeah, it is on rents. It is on rents. Okay. So even if you're a real estate professional, it's not going to Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, for real estate professionals, it does, it does not apply. All right. So let's, let's be very, very clear. We have two types of income that you're going to be looking at. You're going to have capital gains and you're going to have rental ordinary income. The rents that you receive as ordinary income when you're a real estate professional is not subject to the net investment income tax. Right. The capital gains that you receive will be subject to the net investment income tax, according to Jeff. Yep. Extraordinary. Now, we can always look at that, but I, I don't believe uh, somebody says the Dominion code crashed my computer. These people are having some fun with this. Uh, if in trading stocks and options do long term gains offset both short term and long term losses. Well, yes, so it's really the opposite. So your long term and short your long term losses offset both short term gain and long term gain, mm -hmm. uh, which is why uh, you need to hire a year old for your IT department. It's just my computer, guys. I overuse it and I take it with me everywhere and then it just does bad things sometimes. Uh, how much can you give to charity and receive a full credit, even if filing a standard deduction? So, David, this year you can give 100% cash donations to charity and write off. Uh, excuse me. You can give a cash donation to charity and write off 100% of it against your adjusted gross income. Uh, you always choose between the standard deduction and taking a Schedule A deduction, which is what a charity is, the uh, itemized deduction. And, yes, you can decide. Um, let's keep jumping in. We have so many questions popping in and I just get, re I can't resist. It's like a moth to the flame. I want to just answer them. Uh, can a corporation managing real estate qualify for section 1202? Then what is section 1202? Just so you know, that is Jeff's favorite question today, so he can answer it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, the investment property held, uh, 
held title as an LLC and was kept in the deceased father's living trust. The heir is a minor child. If I transfer it out to the child's name, will it affect property taxes? Very good question. A, the recently passed California Proposition 19 will allow California to reassess any non-primary residents properties transferred to heirs at market rate starting February 21st, 2021. Uh, we will absolutely go into that. I'm trying to meet my goal of $50,000 for infinity investing. Congratulations. That's awesome, by the way. Let's say I have $30,000 that I, that I could use to buy stocks, ETFs, et cetera. Could I use all $30,000 to purchase stocks without violating the annual $6,000 IRA contributions, or am I bound to the $6,000 contribution limit? We'll break that down for you. My elderly mother has her house in a trust uh, living will, probably a living trust, with the fair market value today at approximately $700,000 and the cost basis for the property at $289,000. Their current tax assessment is $341,000, protected under California Proposition 13. And if you guys aren't familiar with, with Proposition 13, it's just a fa it's, it's so that you can't hike up property taxes on people uh, who've been living in a house for a long time, especially protecting our uh, elders so that they don't have a nasty surprise of, of reassessments as, as values go up. Just limits it. Is there a federal tax liability if the property is deeded, transferred as a gift to a child to avoid the implications for property taxes, assuming the mother is living after February 16th, 2021. We will go over that too. Um, I have a single member LLC that owns a single family house. I guess it's, it's single family home with a tenant and also is used to book my real estate bookkeeping side hustle. Love side hustles. It's one of my favorite words for some reason is when you, you hear it or two words side hustle, but thing is cool. How do I segregate the reporting on the tax return between Schedule C and E? I'm also assuming only the service res revenue is subject to self-employment tax. Can you please confirm? And I'm going to rely on Jeff on that one. I have two self-directed IRAs for real estate. One property is a single family residence that produces IRA income and incurs IRA expenses. The other property is some land where apartments will be built with a partner. Hence, only expenses occurred in 2020. Question, what kind of tax reporting needs to be done on these properties? We'll go through that too. I was displaced from a corporate job last April and had to execute several years of company stock options, not having to, the cash to purchase the equivalent shares. The options were executed and sold for short-term gain. This short-term gain is taxes or any income re and reflected on my W-2. Outside of retirement contributions and charitable donations, are there any other vehicles to reduce a six-figure liability? Uh, I am a Airbnb host who has been invited to participate in their direct share program, which lets me buy a limited number of shares at the I IPO price. What words of wisdom do you have? I own the properties personally. They are not yet in land trusts, and my management company runs the Airbnb. So we'll go over all that. Congratulations, by the way. Um, that's fantastic. They should do well. Um, even right now, Airbnb is not, not doing horrible. Can you explain how passive activity losses from depreciation are used against the tax liability on the sale of the same passive income asset? So I, I know that Jeff is jumping at the bit on that. And he loves explaining disposition and stuff. We'll go over that. I did a 1031 exchange to buy a condo, which I rented out for two years. This March, I moved into it due to COVID easier to rent the single family home we were in than the condo. It's now my primary residence and I want to put it in a revocable trust. What are the tax implications of doing this? When I go to sell, will it still be treated as a rental and I'll pay capital gains or will my years of living there impact the ratio to the last five years for primary residence? We'll go through that too. My employer sent back a portion of the previous year's 401k contributions to comply with the IRS rules for highly compensated employees. Can the return balance be applied to a separate QRP against last year's tax deferred contribution limits? And I will break that one down. That one gets 
a little bit weird when you're talking about highly compensated employees and having to refund, but we'll get at what the hell that stuff is. A uh, home sells for a profit of 500000 after two years. I'm splitting the profits 50-50. How do I avoid paid tax on the entire profit? So we'll get into that one. And then uh, Mia Culpa. All right, last Tax Tuesday, somebody gave me good advice in the chat and the question, and I rebuffed it. I think it was Wendy. And we were talking about California and specifically how you could hold deeds. And there's something called community property with right of survivorship. And uh, in my world, I tend to do everything as trust, but she was absolutely 100% correct. And I was absolutely 100% incorrect. I said, I'd look, and this is me doing a mea culpa saying I screwed up. And I should have listened. She was smart and I was being dumb. So there's me. Oops. I was going to draw a picture. There. There. There's me being a dummy. And there's the tears. Uh, hey, you know what? You guys are oftentimes putting stuff into that uh, question and answer. And I should listen more. There's absolutely. There's joint tenants with right of survivorship. which is what we're used to. Tenants in common and uh, owning things in trust. And apparently there's a few states that allow to own things as community property so you can make sure you don't lose a step up in basis. Um, the bigger issue on California, just so you guys understand where we come from, I'll give myself a little bit of hair, is um, in California, the cost of probating a house in your name um, can be extraordinarily high. The uh, one of the things that you get around that on is is by putting in a living trust, and that's what I usually tell people. It's like you know, at some point we're going to want to have a trust around property, uh, partially because I don't want to just give things to people because sometimes they're not prepared for it, and plus unintended consequences. Uh, number two is the cost of probate is so high in case uh, it is not covered uh, under a joint ownership. Uh, but what Wendy pointed out quite correctly is that if you're owning something with a right of survivorship, you avoid the uh, you avoid the probate completely. So quite often you'll have a husband and wife owning things as joint tenants. Uh, uh, more likely than not with right of survivorship, meaning first spouse passes, second spouse gets it. Uh, if you're owning it as community property with right of survivorship, same thing. Uh, the bigger issue there is on the step up and basis, um, making sure that there's no issues that the community property provider survivorship puts it to bed quite easily. Um, same thing as if you're putting it in a trust. But in either case, I don't like seeing things owned as tenants in common, especially in your name or uh, without right or survivorship, because now you're guaranteed to go through a probate and probate's very expensive in California specifically because it's based on asset value. So you have a million dollar house, you're, you're looking at about a $26,000 or thereabouts probate, somewhere over 20,000, which is just too much, even if you have a big old loan against it. So we don't like that. Um, so anyway, that was me being bad. Sometimes I do that. Jeff, you have to deal with me. I know. And so uh, never wanted to be said that I don't eat crow when I make a mistake and that was, mistake. All right. Can a corporation managing real estate qualify for section 1202? What is section 1202? Uh, I, I like this question because they asked that they could qualify for it and then they asked what it was. <laughs> Here's the code section. It's partial exclusion for gain from certain small business stock. And what it's really meant to do is if I invest in certain types of companies and it's smallly capitalized, like less than 10 million, I think is what the number is. Um, and then I sell it, I hold it for a period of time and I sell it, uh, hold it for uh, five years or more. And I sell it, then I don't have to pay tax on all the, all the gain. But then there's these little things called exclusions and they exclude a whole bunch of stuff, including things that, are involving uh, banking, insurance, finance, leasing, investing, or similar businesses, any business involving the production and extraction of products with 
respect to which deduction is allowable. I don't even know what that is, but uh, hotels, motels, similar businesses, any trade involving the performance of services in the fields of health law, engineering, architectural, accounting, actuary, like there's just a laundry list. Uh, big ones are financial services, brokerage services, and any trader business where the principal asset of such trader business is their reputation or skill or one or more of its employees. I think we're out of it. Like we're not going to get it. Yeah. 1202 was really designed to get people to invest in specifically manufacturing type companies. Um, so they could exempt some of their gains if they later sold that stock. And, and right now it's a hundred percent exclusion up to, I believe $1 million of gain. So it, it's really nice, but it's very difficult to qualify for this. Okay. Somebody's asking, can they see things? Can you guys all see my screen? I think you guys can. Hopefully you can. Uh, Patty or somebody, maybe just give me a heads up. Yes. All right, cool. So there's a couple people says they can. I think that it's go to meeting being naughty today. So we're going to put it on the naughty list. So we're not going to give them anything for Christmas. They know we're not going to use their platform anymore. So they're giving us heck. Maybe that's it. We'll still use them. We like go to meeting. Uh, somebody asked a really good question about owning a qualified opportunity zone fund or qualified opportunity fund in. Their 401k. And I would just say this makes absolutely no sense because you have to have tax deferred. Somebody's again, some of you guys put some pretty funny stuff in here. Uh, you have to have tax, you have to have capital gains and it's exempt from tax. So you're not going to be able to invest in it. You could invest in an opportunity zone. You could absolutely it's just you get no tax benefit from it. Um, similarly, I've seen people invest their retirement plans and tax exempt income, municipal bonds, and it doesn't really serve your purpose. <laughs> it does the opposite. <laughs> you just invested in something that you wouldn't have to pay tax on that now you have to pay tax on. It's horrible, right? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, because when it gets distributed out, see, everybody's saying Zoom is king. Zoom causes me a little bit of consternation once in a while too. I think it's just technology in general. Um, Somebody says the investment property held title as an LLC and was kept in the deceased father's living trust. So this sounds like it's a piece of real estate in an LLC. The LLC is owned by the living trust. The heir is a minor child. If I transfer to the child's name, will it affect the property taxes? And the answer is it depends on your county and your jurisdiction. In a lot of places, yes, if you change more than 50% of beneficial interest, you're going to have an impact on property taxes. You're probably going to be dealing with transfer taxes. Will it impact federal capital gains or anything like that? Uh, more often than not, no. And most importantly here, if this was investment property and it was in a living trust, uh, there's a basis step up mm -hmm. on the father passing, assuming that the beneficiary of the living trust is that minor child. So let's assume that it's not and it's to a spouse uh, or somebody else, then uh, then chances are no. And then we have the issue of the minor child. Um, if it's transferred to the minor child's name, can a minor child own an interest in an LLC? Actually, they can. It's just the question is whether they would have the capacity to sign any documents. No, they probably have a guardian. Um, and in this particular case, it would be the LLC that's actually being transferred. So if the LLC becomes owned by the child, then how is that child actually going to hold title? And is there a manager on it? Is there a trustee? Is it sitting in trust? Is it, is Jeff the beneficiary of the trust? And Jeff says, Hey, I actually want this just to go to my child now. And then the question is for gifting purposes, is it being used against Jeff's lifetime gift or is Jeff just disclaiming and the child is the next beneficiary? And like you have a few issues, but without getting too deep into it. So if, if the child is the direct beneficiary mm -hmm. of the decedent, yep. would it be better to leave it in the, uh, the trust that results from? It might be. It, and it depends. It depends on the trust. Because the trust in the, in the child, my child are in the same tax brackets. So there's Correct. no tax advantage there. There's none. 
And I'm thinking maybe now you have a trustee to oversee for that child's. Again, it depends on what the what the rules are. So most of the time, a trustee is going to be directed not to distribute uh, principal, especially to under 18 beneficiaries. And usually you increase that and you say that they don't have a right to it. So the trustee will sit on it. But let's just say that the trustee is supposed to distribute all assets to beneficiaries. Then you might end up distributing that LLC to that in that, that underage beneficiary, which again, it's not unheard of, but usually you're going to have a component of, of a guardian, mm -hmm. uh, somebody else handling it, uh, obviously. Uh, and it depends on the type of income because this is weird. I hadn't really thought about this. What if you, uh, what if that's a minor child and it's kitty tax? They're receiving income from the trust and it's passive income or it's kitty tax income. Then that would be assessed to the parent of the child, correct? Uh, well, with the new tax brackets, the, the kids now have their own tax brackets, which are the same as the uh, state taxes or as the trust taxes. Mm. Um, I haven't looked at, yeah, they, they got they're rid of the no kitty tax. They're no longer taxed at the No, that's right. right. I still think of the kitty tax. Kitty tax is completely gone now. Though. Right. Uh, interesting. All right, more questions from you guys. Oh, boy. Um, let's see. I have a client who wants to sell their primary residence. Uh, both husband and wife lived there for 20 years. They want to downsize to a smaller Single family home purchased for 40 and that nine now worth 1.5 million. So they have tax exempt for 500. So they're going to pay, uh, buy a smaller house for 650. So overall, how much would they pay the, on the gain? Is there any other way to avoid capital gains tax? By the way, the house they're going to purchase will have to be under their daughter because they don't have enough income. Okay. So here's the question is how much debt do they have? It sounds, it sounds like if they're selling the house for 1.5, that they should have close to a million dollars of gain of that gain. And then on, on that same question is assuming this was never used. It says they lived there for 20 years. And it's, if it's never been used as a rental, there's no depreciation recapture. So what we have is 489 that they have as a, uh, Lord, that one just go, to, just moved off the screen, didn't it? Sometimes, let me get this. Here we go. Sorry, guys. Uh, the more questions that come in, it just pushes them right off the screen. And this one just pushed me right off the screen. There we go. Um, so assuming that they didn't use it as a as a rental, what we have is they they bought it for forty nine. We're going to assume that's the basis. There might be some adjustments if they did improvements on the property, but. What they're going to have is a step up, husband and wife, assuming that this they haven't sold another house. If they, this is the only house they've been living in, so they haven't sold one within two years. They meet the other requirements of 121. They would have 500,000 uh, uh, that they do not have to pay gain on. Mm -hmm. They would have 5 million that they would have capital gains on. So depending on their tax bracket, they're going to be 0, 15, 20% plus uh, they're over the 250 mark, so they're going to have net investment income tax and they're going to have state income tax, depending on where they live. If you wanted to avoid that entirely, what you would do is you'd take the house that's worth 1.5 million and you'd rent it. And you'd rent it for a period of time. Um, there's no hard and fast rule, but you'd, you'd convert it into a rental and then you would sell it. And what you what that allows you to do is 1031 exchange into other properties, but then you would have to buy real estate that is worth at least 1.5 million. So you'd have to do a real hard search on this. So you're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of a hundred thousand dollars of tax to determine whether it's worth it. It might be something they want to uh, contemplate. The other thing is it's capital gains. So if they have five hundred thousand dollars of capital gains, that's when you start looking for unrealized loss or any other capital losses or if there's any carry forwards uh, or if they're voracious givers maybe you're looking at this is the year you sell the property maybe they're going to give this is the year they make a big gift um, so we we look at those things 
Um, I hope that helps. Anything else I'm missing on that one? Um, jumping forward, because I know I grabbed a lot of questions for today, Jeff. I couldn't help it. It's the last one of the year. The recently passed California Proposition 19 will allow California to reassess any non-primary residence properties transferred to heirs at market rate starting February 21st, 2021. Um, yes, it does. Yeah. And they're asking with a question mark. Yeah, so what it is is it used to be, and I actually took a screenshot, Jeff, five minutes before we started. <laughs> We're like, hey, let's take a screenshot of this. Uh, this is from the Franchise Tax Board uh, or the Board of Equalization. Board of Equalization, yeah. yeah. so the Board of Equalization in California, and this is from their site. You can just go Prop 19 and look at it. Uh, but it kind of breaks down what all the difference is. And it used to be that I, a parent could leave their um, their kids, their primary residence, and it wouldn't be reassessed. And what they found is that lots of kids were inheriting big properties. You know, imagine that you, you know, you get the great Malibu property and then they just turn it into a rental and they're not getting a reassessment. And that's not fair. People said, Hey, they're not really using it. Um, so the question becomes, what's a fair way to handle it? And so they said, well, if you live in it, fine. And then, um, what's the the value limit they put a a value limit on the current taxable value plus one million dollars which i don't know what that i don't know how they're going to calculate that there, there's some factor as to if i'm gifting things whether i'm going to be able to give a very large amount of money uh but it, we have its current taxable value which means the taxable value let, let's assume that mom or dad had a property and they paid i don't know 200,000 and now it's mm -hmm. worth 2 million so in its taxable value for the assessment is like that earlier example we have it's it's 400,000 then the amount that that you could protect is 1.4 million it's not the full value of that property so what you're going to do is you're going to have lots of reassessments on properties um, especially somebody says free and clear property on that that one we were talking about earlier about selling the property you may want to uh, you know sasha you may want to look and see whether it makes sense to turn that into a 1031 exchange otherwise um you're looking at a little bit of an issue they would have to buy other real estate with it that's the only problem uh, but i love real estate so mm -hmm. i wouldn't be worried about that so prop yeah going back to prop 19 i'm sorry Got lost my chain of thought there. The uh, Prop 19, the big thing is it's it's only one child. And it, I mean, it's the principal residence. So I should say it's it's only one property. If you leave it to two kids, I think they're both going to have to live there. It's kind of wacky. I, I got the impression that this was really directed at like San Francisco, Sonoma, Napa counties, and San Jose, mm -hmm. where you have a lot of low tax properties that are worth a lot of money. Yep. And I think, are you grandfathered in until February 15th? I think it's any transfers after that point. Yeah. If it's otherwise, you're fine. Um, and then I know what you're saying. Julie was, Julie's writing and saying Prop 19 was a trade off to allow the elderly to transfer their tax bases to a new residence in different counties, especially relevant for fire victims. And what Julie's referring to is under current law, you could sell a house and replace it. Let's say you had a house that was decimated in a fire and you get a replacement property. You have to be in the same county and you could do that once, I believe. Now we can do it up to three times and it's statewide. Right. But uh, I'm not an expert in Prop 19. You'd have to take a peek at it. It's uh, It was intended to get more money realistically and stop a unequitable problem of the people who uh who were forced out of their homes because of fires 
Yeah, I, I agree with they said that's what the purpose was to help the elderly, and it's actually the title for elderly and dis- disabled. But mm-hmm. uh, I really don't see it changing that much for those particular people involved. Yeah, somebody says, hey, they, they, they want to erode away Prop 13. Yeah, of course they do. There's a ton of value in their real estate, and they basically stopped it from being able to to hammer away on folks. Did you grab the old broken? Yeah, I got the broken one. You grab the old broken chair. I'm playing with my broken chair. I love that. All right. I am trying to meet my goal of $50,000 for infinity investing. And those of you guys who are unfamiliar with infinity investing, um, we are teaching another workshop, by the way, on December 19th. We weren't going to do it, but then they did all these lockdowns. And so... Patty's worst nightmare is always we have an open weekend and uh, there's nothing on it and people are stuck at home. This is horrible. So let's make it a learning opportunity. And then they realize captive audience. That's exactly right. I said, so I was like, people are going to be sitting here. They're going to be so annoyed. Um, And so we weren't going to do it. And then I said, let's do it. Infinity investing is fun. It's free. Somebody says, shout out to infinity investing. Absolutely. Our guys are killing it, uh, absolutely killing it. So, yeah, she th- they were real scared to say this is the last tax Tuesday of the year. And I said, well, aren't there more Tuesdays? And they go, no. <laughs> what is Infinity Investing? It's a, it's really easy. Um, we buy assets and set liabilities. We look at things very differently. We narrow the stock market down to about 60 companies, and then we rate them, and we buy income producing. So uh, infinity just means you don't have to work anymore because you have enough passive income coming in. So you could live an infinite number of days without working. And then when you work, it's gravy. But we, we, we go through a very, very precise and systematic growth of our income. And we start off with dividend paying companies that we sell options on, which we call being a stock market landlord. And you start by trying to generate $50,000. So uh, so this individual is working it up and they're starting to build up their money. When uh, somebody says it changed my life, thank you. You're very welcome. Um, and it, it, it's not rocket science. It's just very systematic. And, you know, I, Jeff, we do over what 6,000 returns a year. Yeah. Um, we know who makes money and who doesn't. And we know who consistently makes money Mm -hmm. and you can kind of see the same things over and over and over again. So we just go and say, let's take the gambling out of this. Let's make it very consistent, make the world very simple, quit trying to reinvent the wheel and being Mr. Smarty pants on everything. Let's just go and, and uh, here's the things we should invest in. So uh, in infinity investing, it's free. The basic membership we've now made free forever. So anybody that joins, um, it's not going to be a cost. You could, we have trading rooms open on Wednesdays, the basic trading room, and uh, you can join us for free. There's not going to be a cost to it. So you can go in there and learn how to invest without the, without fear and without a huge price tag to get learning. So bring anybody who's a young person before they get into debt, especially because we'll show them the, the other way, right? Let's say that we have $30,000 that we could use to buy stocks, CTS, et cetera. Uh, could I use all 30? You, you, the first off is we want to, we want to separate these things from each other. So uh, for young people, especially, I don't, I tell them all to invest originally through a Roth IRA. And the reason we say that is because the math goes like this. If your current um, tax bracket is below what you will be at when you retire. So if I, when I retire, if I'm going to have a higher tax bracket than I am right now, then you should do a Roth IRA or a Roth 401k, depending on how much money I want to get into it. Mm-hmm. So if I am less than 50, the amount that I can put in this year, what is it, 6,000? I was going to say 65, but I say 6,000. If I'm over 50, I can put $7,000 into a traditional or a Roth IRA. Now there's on the traditional, we have to use a little bit of analysis. If it's, if, if you're below 50,000 or the, we don't even have to worry about it. You can absolutely put it into these things. Um, if you're below hundred, I think you're pretty safe. It's when you get above that, that we have to look to see whether you have another 401k, things like that. Cause the traditional may become an issue. But uh, if I put money into that, so let's say I'm a young person, 
So my daughter graduated college last year. She's applying for med school and uh, and working at the time. She's been taking some more classes. She's doing all the applications. You know, let's let's just hope that she gets in and she can go help people. That's the way I look at it. So let's just we put money into an IRA or or a, a Roth IRA. Those are both fantastic. That if we put money into the IRA, she doesn't have to pay tax on it. So on her income, it comes off the top. We put it into the Roth. She doesn't get a tax deduction, but she'll never pay tax ever again on that money. So uh, it's an absolutely fantastic vehicle. Now let's just say that a year from now, she needs that money. On the Roth, she can always pull out the $6,000 she put in. Right. No penalty, no nothing. On the traditional, it depends on what she pulls it out for, but she's going to have tax on it, perhaps a penalty. Hope that makes sense. And then on the Roth, if she tries to take out the growth on it within a five-year period, there could be penalty. But no, 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 there's never going to be a situation where she's going to get hit with penalties and taxes on a Roth. The only one is if she took a deduction. Yeah, somebody says, where's the, where's the whiteboard? We're going to go to Zoom so we can do all that stuff. Uh, I could draw all over this thing too, but I think that's what killed us last time. That's what I was trying to do. And so I could do this there. See, I'm drawing. Um, so you have kind of the, the traditional IRA and you have the Roth. If you have $30,000 in the Roth, you could make a million dollars and it's still 0% tax when it comes out in the traditional, we get a, if we put $30,000 in, we, in theory, we got the tax benefit by deducting those payments. The thirty thousand. Yeah, the thirty thousand over a number of years. Yeah. So by the by the deduct, deducting the thirty thousand, and as a result, when we make a million dollars, it is taxable at some point when you're over the age of seventy two plus you have what's called a required minimum distribution. You pay tax over time. And that could be a really small amount or it could be a big amount, depending on what you're at. So um, to answer your question, then, assuming that you haven't already put those monies in, you just have the annual limits. So you could put the $6,000 into your Roth, which is what I would do. And I would keep the other $24,000 in your name or in an entity, depending on whether you have a bunch of deductions you could do. Uh, but anyway, these are these are things that could uh, absolutely take place. And somebody else said, well, what about if your kids are going to school? Um, what other what other things you could do? There's 529 plans. Uh, but the other big one is having your kids work for your company. So even if you have a small little company, a management company, whatever it is, make sure that your kid is working for it instead of you just paying for their college. Because if you pay for their college, it comes out of your tax bracket, whatever you might be. If it, your child, if they start making money, the first 12,800 is not taxable. So it gets really cool. Is your trading class on every Wednesday? It's a trading room. And yes, it's every Wednesday. Eric Dodds is a fiduciary who's in there showing you guys how to trade. And it's, uh, absolutely no cost. It's what we call free. 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 Yeah. Patty can send you over. Patty, I told her that I might mention infinity and she's probably ready to punch me in my nose. Can I contribute fifty six or six thousand dollars to Roth IRA and also six thousand dollars to a Roth TSP thrift savings plan? I don't know if there was a rough thrift savings plan. Is it? Yeah, the, the, the TSP, uh, it's government plan. It's, mm -hmm. they're, do they have a Roth component? I'm, done. I, I'm pretty sure they do now. Uh, but it's just like a 401k plan. So the, the, I think you can actually do much more than $6,000 in the TSP. Right. If it's the TSP, then you have 19500 So like, I'm just a little bit out. I, I've not seen that. So if they do... Then you have a nineteen thousand five hundred dollar limit. If you are uh, over the age of fifty, you have a catch up, and that catch up is six thousand dollars this year, which means you could put up to uh, what would that be? Twenty four five. Uh, twenty six. Uh, twenty. Nineteen five six. Twenty four. The twenty five five. I'm sorry. Yeah, twenty five five. So you could. Throw, I thought they may have jumped it to. Uh, 
6,500. I'm not, I think it's six. No, the, the 6,000 catch up is not adjusted ever. Yeah, that's not adjusted. All right. So something, uh, the limit is 60, is, is 12,5 and catch up is 65. I think it's 65. I was just looking at a sheet and I think it's 65. Um, Cause I think it's 26,000 that you can put in defer. Um, and yes, you can do multiple contributions. It's just, the question is, I'm limited. Yes, yeah, somebody said 26,000 too. I think that's, I mean, I think you're right. I think, I think that, uh, I think they, I thought they adjusted that once. I know it's not tabbed, but I believe that, I can't remember where I saw that. You're thinking maybe a one-time adjustment. I think it was a one-time adjustment. I know it's not inflation, but I think they made it 20, uh, 65. I'm just looking at a cheat sheet. I think the cheat sheet is not correct, but who knows? Whatever it is, we'd, we'd verify it. And uh, you can absolutely put a big check. Yeah, somebody else is saying 6,500 too. So I, I think that's right. In the recesses of my brain, uh, thrift savings plan, yes. Um, then you could put it in there. Here, here's a fun one is you could put the you could put the money in, in that's the employee deferral portion. And then there's the employer uh, participation where they, they, they can put money on your behalf. You know, you could actually put the employer can contribute up to your salary into your uh, buckets of um, inside the 401k or the retirement plan up to $57,000. That includes the deferral portion. Um, it can only deduct 25% of that. The portion that it doesn't deduct, you can actually roll into a, your Roth bucket during the year. And so you don't get a deduction for it, but it's a huge amount that's now sitting in a Roth portion. Um, somebody's saying, hey, all I see is a Q&A screen. You're correct. That's all I have up right now. Uh, and somebody says, how long is it? Um, oh, the office hours uh, or the the trading room is open for two hours. Uh, to, 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 we'll take a look at this stuff. So uh, somebody says there's a whole bunch of questions coming in on that. Let me see. We are recording this. You can send that over. Um, somebody says 2021 limit is 19,500, the elective, and then a 26, or should be 6,600 catch up. So that's for next year. Um, yeah, absolutely. So. So he says this year it's 6,500. Okay. So everybody's saying 6,500. Um, let's jump into more questions. My elderly mother has her house in a trust. Um, she says living well, but it's not a living, it's a living trust. Uh, with the fair market value today at approximately $700,000 and a cost basis for the property of 289. Their current tax assessment is three. 41, uh, 341,000. Is there federal tax liability if the property is deeded, transferred as a gift to a child, uh, assuming the mother is living after February 16th, uh, 2021? So if you gift a property to a child, um, you have to be wary of Prop 13, no matter, like right now, not not a big deal because you can give it to, to children. Uh, you're not going to have to worry about a reassess, uh, my understanding. The after February, then, yeah, you have to worry about it no matter what. But from a federal tax standpoint, so just ignoring uh, California taxes, federal is um, the way it works is I can gift up to 11 Point eight million dollars per uh, per spouse. I can give those to uh, to somebody else and not pay tax on that transfer. Mm -hmm. That's that's my estate and gift tax exclusion, and so I can use all that up giving up giving property away. So the fair market value of seven hundred thousand. First off, I can give that and not pay tax on it, it and I can take it against my lifetime exclusion, this, this big, huge 11.8 million. We don't know what it's going to happen, what, what, what's going to happen to it in the, in the years to come. It's, it's set to go back down to 5.4. Uh, both spouses get it. And there's something called portability, meaning that they, they, you use both. So you have like 
you have a huge amount, 22 or 23.6 million mm -hmm. that you can give away. Um, the problem is, is when you do that, then you get the basis of that individual. So you would get the same cost basis uh, as, as elderly mother. Um, so you could gift it to a child and you're just giving up the step up in basis, which may or may not be something that you're worried about. You could do a tax analysis on it and say, if you're going to keep it in that, in the family, it might be wise to do this now because then your grandfather did under prop 13 and, uh, you're not going to be, you're not going to have to pay a huge bunch of, um, of tax elder. but the child will have now have to make that their primary residence correct i think if you did it prior to february okay. i think that your grandfather did and uh i think that was the point yeah somebody said that was the point they want to get it out of their name what forms do you have to fill out the gift tax i always forget whether that's the 706 or 709 uh 709 is the gift tax 709 right so you're filing out and you're letting the irs know the treasury know that you're using a part of part of your lifetime gifts. The one that you don't have to report is if it's fifteen thousand dollars or less per recipient. So then you don't have to worry. Now, if, if they made this gift, um, this gift would still be subject to the look back period for Medicare or Medicaid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if if you gift it, then when they start talking about whether you qualify for Medicaid then th what is it a five-year look back i think it's a five-year look back yeah mm -hmm. yes um next question i know we're getting along here i have a single member llc that owns my uh single basically a house with a tenant and i also use it uh to book my real estate uh, bookkeeping side hustle so there's two businesses here one's a rental business one is bookkeeping and then their question is, what forms would I use? Would I report all of that income on one form or am I gonna put the rental income on E and my active income on C? And uh, the other question is, hey, if it goes on to C, do I also have to pay self-employment tax on it, which is old age, disability, survivor's insurance, and Medicare, uh, which is 15.3% on active income and so jeff what do you say so what, what goes on schedule e would only be your rental income and expenses mm -hmm. uh everything else would go on schedule c uh it would be subject to self-employment tax if it was income uh as far as uh, separating the segregating them word use uh the best way to do that in if you're using quickbooks is to use a classified profit and loss statement where you're classifying each transaction as a Schedule C or it's a Schedule E transaction. Now, depending on how much you're making on your side hustle, the fact that we have two schedules here kind of begs the question. You really should, uh, you really should separate those two businesses out because that Schedule C income with the with the self employment income, you may want to make that into an S corp for purposes of avoiding portion of the self-employment tax. It really depends on how much you're making. If this is a side hustle where you're making five or six grand, don't worry about it. If it's a side hustle where you're making 50 grand, we should worry about it because it's going to pay off to, to switch that over to an escort. Right. Um, somebody says, could I rent out the, the, the LLC to the court? No, they're like in this particular case, this is a, you have a rental property that's, that's separate. You could always have your side hustle S Corp or C Corp, depending on what your situation is. You can always have that be the manager of that LLC. And we can move money from the rents up into it. Um, if there's a reason to do it, like we're always going to kind of look it out and say, what's the reality of the situation and how do we avoid it? Uh, would you pay yourself rent to reduce your SE tax? Well, rents aren't subject to the self-employed employment tax. So you don't have to worry about that. And the way that it sounds is a single member LLC is probably being ignored for tax purposes. So as far as the IRS is concerned, this is all just you. Um, it sounds like they're a bookkeeper, so they'll understand the class system. Mm -hmm. 
Some more questions that are coming in. Uh, somebody says, yes, the point is, is not having it as a primary residence. I'm in Washington state. Want to keep that as my um, primary residence, not worried about the Medicare implications. So they want to gift it to somebody and just want to keep it in the, the house. Uh, I probably wouldn't gift it. Uh, there are some ways to maintain it as a primary residence. It's called a qualified personal residence trust or a QPERT. And what you can do is you can give it to trust that goes to your heirs. You get to live in there as long as you're able. And then it goes to your kids. And that, that way it's not a life estate, which you could, that's another option for you. But uh, that way you don't have to worry about anything that, that you do and any liabilities that you incur, they could never take the property. Uh, some, oh, I did pay for the LLC. Should I take a loss? I'm not sure. I made an LLC for a deal that fell through and I've not done anything. Oh, no need to pay taxes. Correct. Oh, you would want the loss to fall through. Uh, at a minimum, if you set up an LLC for a deal that fell through, you have the organizational expenses and the startup expenses. You'd want to capture those and take them as a loss. Um, Question. I have two self-directed IRAs for real estate. And for those of you guys who are not familiar, not a QRP, a qualified personal residence uh, trust, which is different than a QRP. Sorry, guys. Um, I have two self-directed IRAs for real estate. So they have two IRAs that hold property. One property is a single family residence that produces IRA income and incurs IRA expenses. So there's probably one of the IRAs paying the expenses. And the other property is some land. It's just sitting there and it's going to eventually be built. Hence, only expenses are incurred in 2020. The question is, what kind of tax reporting? I don't think you really have any. Well, uh, on the first one, the single family home, there, are, there is no reporting at all. I don't know. Zero. You're, you're, you're doing a disclosure. And I forget what the form is where you're saying I have real estate in an IRA, but I, I can't remember. Um, do you know what that form is where you're, mm -hmm. I have to look at that. Oh, I know it. It's off the top of my tongue. I'll look it up when you're, when you're answering something. Uh, the other property uh, that will be built with a partner. Uh, as soon as you have a partner in a, and you're incurring expenses, you're going to have to file a partnership return even if the other partner is a QRP or IRA. Mm -hmm. um, you're getting the K-1. You're getting a K-1 that you're going to stick in a, in a file cabinet and not do anything with at the uh, IRA level. Uh, but you still will have a uh, filing requirement for the partnership. Okay. Kind of crazy. I told you I would look at this. There's a disclosure statement. And what is that disclosure statement? It's in 26 CFR 1.4086, but what's the form? Uh, uh, do I need a statement? Where, where's my disclosure form? Gosh darn it, where's my disclosure statement? You're going to have one. I'm just looking, trying to figure out what the form number is. Oh, boy. It's all these other things other than the form, so... Anyway, somebody may know it. No, it's not a 6,600. It's not a, it's actually got a number. <laughs> so the custodian sends it in. Um, form. I'm just going to see. I'm doing the old Google thing here. I'll recognize it when I see it. It's like a 12 something or something goofy. It's not the 5,500 and it's not the, uh, the other one. Anyway, I'm not going to make you guys wait while I look it up. Uh, or uh, 5498, I think it might be it. 5498, yeah. So you, you fill out a form and then the custodian sends it in. So it's a, I think it's a 5498 if I'm not mistaken. All right, so what kind of tax reporting? That's it. You really don't have to do much else other than what Jeff was describing is if you're partners, you're gonna have, you know, the partnership itself has mm -hmm. to do the, re right. the reporting. Right. Here's one. I was displaced from a corporate job last April and had to execute or forfeit several years of company stock options. So they had to execute him 
not having the cash to purchase the equivalent shares, the options were executed and sold for short-term capital gains. So the, in other words, I either buy all the stocks or I cash out my option, which is going to be a huge chunk of change. This short-term gain is taxes, ordinary income, and reflected on my W-2. Outside of retirement contributions and charitable donations, are there any other vehicles to reduce a six-figure tax liability? Jeff, what do you think? Well, if this was earlier in the year, uh, I, I would say just maybe investing in uh, an investment property, cost segregating that and take, uh, since he's unemployed, he could claim real estate professional. Um, if you met the requirements. So what Jeff's saying is, there were some things that you could have done if you hit the 750 hour requirement and it was more than anything else you did. And so. the, yeah, this late in the game, um, the only thing I really have that works is harvesting any losses you may have. You're talking about having quite a bit of capital gain. Um, yeah, you have short term capital gain. So long term capital losses and short term capital losses would offset it. Ordinary losses would also offset it the way you get those. If you felt like it is you go oil and gas and tangible, but again, I don't know how much they'd be able to incur before the end of the year. I would say very little. There's conservation easements that you could look at. You can look at doing something like that might give you a solar credit on your house. You know, every little dollar that comes off the top, if it's a sizable amount, you said six figure tax liability, which means your seven figures of income, every dollar is is a huge savings. So we're just gonna be looking. And when you're looking at charitable donations, also consider that um, it could be your charity that you still control. So even though you give the money away or you give assets away, it doesn't mean that it's gone outside your realm. You're still directing those for a charitable purpose. And there's a lot of different charitable purposes. Um, my personal favorite is is housing, you know, moderate income housing, low income housing, veterans housing, uh, transitional housing, you name it, uh, autistic housing, all those things qualify as a charitable activity. So uh, you could do this. Why would these be short term instead of long term? It depends on how long they had the option. So he says sold for short term capital gains, which means it's less than a year. Yeah, what occurred here, and you see this a lot, is in order to purchase the options, he had to sell some of the options. Yep. Well, he said, you know, so what he said is he had uh, he had company stock options. And I guess you're right. Uh, he's looking at it saying, how long did you actually hold it? It depends on how they reported it. He says it's, it's taxed as ordinary income on their W-2. So it would have been the vesting of the, of the stock, I imagine. Um, but David, you're... You're right. Um, sometimes we get these questions and you would, it, it, it's usually you want to look at, you want to dig into it and you want to see whether there's any other things uh, available to them. So my guess is that he vested and sold the option. Yeah, they're, they're right, right away. I'm guessing they're incentives, uh, ISOs. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is no tax consequences in the year of purchase of that. Except for any that he would have, any of the is stock there, he would have sold to pay for that. Is there any way to make it long term? No. Because he would have had to invest it and there would have been a taxable event back when it vested, right? Correct. And so he had to, he had to basically sell it because he couldn't buy it. So he vested and then, yeah, we'd have to dig into it. I think even bit. if he makes the, uh, what is the 81B election, that still doesn't make it long term. No, and you're still, all it's doing is you're being taxed on the value uh, the, of the best, uh, previous as opposed to what its fair right. market value is now. So if I had, if I was vesting on something at $26 and it's worth 35, that's all they're doing is avoiding right. the, that extra tax right now. We'd have to look at it. Um, hmm. What are the maximum contributions for self-directed IRAs? It's the same as any other IRA. Self-directed just means that uh, you're allowed, the custodian is basically allowing you to invest in alternative investments. Because usually if I set up an IRA through like uh, Schwab or TD Ameritrade, they're gonna make you buy things that they sell or that they're, they're in the revenue stream on, which is they're gonna make you be in the stock market. If you wanna buy real estate, it's gonna have to be self-directed Usually, I'm going to push people towards a 401k if they're doing real estate. 
And the reason being is because you don't have a custodian. You can do it yourself. And you don't have something called unrelated debt financed income. So um, you want to make sure that you are avoiding that issue. Um, so the person who wrote this question about their short term, it would be worthwhile to sit down with an accountant. Doesn't have to be us, but have somebody go through and really dissect what you have, uh, what, what your options are. You're sitting in December, you may have other options. Even if you're doing like conservation easements and things like that, they're, they have a bad name right now because they're on the, the IRS's listed transaction list if it's too high a, a return. But there's actually valid um, conservation easements and the easement gets uh, audited, not you, mm -hmm. because they're looking at the promoter to make sure that they're actually gifting something away that's actually a gift and not some pretend gift. Somebody says, can you talk more about the housing charity? Um, yeah, uh, 501c3s are really misunderstood. Just, you know, every university, just about every hospital, I should say every university, all major universities are charities or 501c3s. The NFL, the NFL was a charity for a long time. It was, you know, sports leagues, amateur sports leagues are charities. The Major League Baseball is a charity. Um, Ikea is a charity that always throws people off. Good luck figuring that one out, right? Always has been. It's primarily owned by uh, charitable organizations. That's how Ingmar got, you know, it kept, uh, it, it kept the kids from being able to destroy Ikea. He made it so the board can't implode itself and that it can't be sold off. He wanted Ikea to exist for a long time. So he made it really, really, really tough for them to ever um, tear that thing apart. Um, I'm trying to think of any other really good ones, but the point is, is that charity is when you're, you know, is, is when it's not the, the profits aren't going to the shareholders. It's really doing a public benefit. That said, you could still run it. You can still run it as a business and get all the be business benefits, including salaries of an operating charity and a charitable activity can be, uh, and it's already qualified and there's a safe Harbor for it, but moderate housing. So housing for, regular people under HUD. Uh, a lot of people immediately think low income housing, it's it's slumlords and things like that. It's like, no, it's housing for regular families that would meet HUD requirements, which means um, it's not what you think. It's, it's probably fifty, sixty thousand dollar $60,000 families in most places, mi middle class, uh, low to middle class. And we need low income housing, horrifically. It's probably the biggest area that we're missing. We need senior housing. It qualifies. We need housing for autistic adults. There's uh, close to 800,000 right now living at home with parents. And the parents are freaking out, obviously. It's like, what, what, what happens to their child? Who's going to take care of them? If something happens to the parents, so, there's, so they need to put them into a situation where, where they're okay. Uh, yeah, it's estimated to be upwards of a million dollar or a million people. And that's just uh, of working age. Mm -hmm. um, autistic children. We actually, Jim Richardson's uh, interesting at that. That's his life blood right now is, you know, he's, he's, he's been spending a lot of time doing that research. There's um, a ton of need out there. And yes, you could do it. If you put a property into a, a, a housing charity and you've owned that property for more than a year, the donation value is actually the fair market value. So, um, it's actually really interesting. The people that do these things and it is, you know, they're, they're putting them together. And again, it's, it's not your profit. It's not like it's your, you just can take the money out, but you can absolutely uh, operate these things. And uh, in your family can still be regular. You're giving them a job. As I always say, instead of giving them money, give them a job and a purpose. Um, how do you set up a 5-1-C for college students? Uh, depending on, what it is, you know, you'd look and see what's the activity and whether it qualifies. And then it's just uh, it's something we do here, obviously. Uh, we've set up over somewhere three to 4,000 at this point. I think it's over 4,000 successfully. We work with Mark Del Gershio and Tricia Del Gershio. They're absolutely awesome. Somebody says, bike to the beach org. Yeah, there's a whole bunch. Sometimes you guys see me, I put the veterans associations up here. Mm -hmm. So one veterans, which is, uh, or, you know, which is the uh, service animals for uh, veterans, uh, 
prevention of suicide. Operation Surf is another great one where we've had them on Dun, Dun podcasts uh, where they do a lot of good work with, with wounded veterans and helping them. Uh, but it, yeah, so for, for needy college kids, absolutely you could do it. Uh, it's you're setting it up with the state as a normal organization, and then you go through a 1023 application or 1024 application, depending on what your organization is being set up for. And it relates back to the date that you set it up. So you still have time this year, technically, to set up a charity, donate to it, take the deduction this year. The charity has to get its exemption within 27 months, I believe is what, the, what it is, but it, it relates back to the date you set it up. All right. Um, get away from that. We we're answering a bunch of questions. Here we go. Uh, let's see. OZ could defer. See, this is a question that comes here. OZ could defer and earn money for six years before you have to pay the tax. It's correct. So when you're doing an opportunity zone, it's when I have a chair, I have a capital gain event that I need to pay tax on. And within 180 days of the recognition of that, of that event, so either that date or January 1st of the year after it was done. So if you have a capital gain event this year, your 180 days really starts operating January 1st, which gives you 180 days from that date, which is like June 28th or whatever it is. Uh, you'd have to put it into a fund and that fund needs to invest in opportunity zone property within 180 days there. So it's basically you'd have to invest in something that invests in the opportunity zone within basically a year, you know, it could be longer. Uh, the benefit of doing it is you defer your capital gains until uh, what really comes down to is December 20, excuse me, December 31st, 2026. So you're going to, you're going to have a capital gains recognition event. Uh, you're going to have a 10% step up in the basis. So you're only recognizing on 90% on, uh, on the capital gains that you put into the opportunity zone. And then, Assuming that you hold that opportunity zone property for 10 years, you're not going to pay tax on any of that growth. And so uh, they get a little convoluted. People think that they're better than they really are, in my opinion, uh, because, again, you have to have capital gains. You're still going to pay tax on it. You're just deferring it. And there's some other fun stuff. Uh, somebody says solar tax credit. Uh, absolutely. Uh, right now it's 26%. Yeah. And if you're a landlord, you can stick it on your property. And not only can you get the tax credit, but you can also depreciate 87%, 87% of the value, even if you're not out of pocket on it. Yeah, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, all right. I'm an Airbnb host who has been invited to participate in their directed share program, which lets me buy a limited number of shares at the IPO price. What words of wisdom do you have? Uh, somebody says, he says, I own the properties personally. They are not yet in land trust. And my management company runs the Airbnb. Um, Let's walk through that. Yeah, because the Airbnb IPO really has nothing to do with your properties. I mean, isn't that? Yeah, they're, they're two separate issues. You're being invited in to buy the shares at the IPO price. You're probably buying restricted shares, by the way, which means you're not going to be able to sell them for six months. That's my guess. Um, but the, let's assume that you get to buy the share at a dollar and it goes to a hundred, right? And you have this huge amount of gain, that short-term capital gains, unless you hold it for more than a year. My words of wisdom is, uh, is to wait on those. Like if it goes public and you're worried about it diving, buy a put. <laughs> like if you're really worried, buy a put. But you have a capital asset. A lot of people don't realize is that that, that wonderful capital asset can be used to secure a loan and the loan is not taxable. So a lot of these guys get these huge amounts of stock and you think that they're going to pay tax when they sell it. They're not they're waiting to die at some point and step up their basis. They're just going to keep this thing rolling forward. They're going to pay the, the federal estate tax, or they're going to give it away into a uh, irrevocable trust that's uh, non self settled so that they can get it out of the, uh, so that they can get it out of their estate. There, there's a lot of things that you could do so you don't get shellacked with tax. 
But at the end of the day, what they're probably going to do is they're going to borrow against those. It's called a secured or a, a secured line of credit or an equity or let's see, security backed line of credit, SBLLC. And uh, you don't pay any tax on that. And then when you do sell it, it's long term capital gains capped at 20 percent plus the 3.8 plus your state. So like it keeps your taxes pretty low. The properties themselves. Do you want to go over that? I'm hobarting it again. Uh, the properties themselves. Um, we're talking about putting them in land trusts and I assume LLCs. I, I think you do want to accomplish that. I'm assuming these properties are exclusively used for Airbnb. Uh, it gets a little more convoluted when it's a private personal residence. It's also being Airbnb. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like the management company is a separate company. So that's usually going to be a corp. Uh, LLC taxes a corp, S or C. And the reason you do that is because um, if you rent a property and the average rental is seven days or less, mm -hmm. then it's active income. It's a, it's a hotel. So you'd get self-employment tax, you'd have ordinary tax treatment. What you'd end up doing is having the properties themselves held in an LLC that you lease to your Airbnb and Airbnb host business. The Airbnb host business is the active business. And now you're keeping those other properties as passive, which allows you to get some passive income, number one. And number two, you're going to offset that passive income with your depreciation on those properties. And now your active business, your corporation can do an accountable plan. It could pay you a salary, push money into a 401k. Like you have a lot of options if you do it that way. Uh, but my words of wisdom as far as your shares is congratulations. I have I know there's some investment bankers that are involved in that that have done uh, that in an Airbnb should be fantastic. Hopefully you make a ton of money. Um, just you don't have to sell. So even when it goes up and you think I'm scared to death, it's going to come back down Buy a put on it. There's ways to ensure the value of your stock and then use it. Uh, yeah, and it says, if you're worried, call Eric Dodds. Eric's pretty good. What do you guys think of Eric? Anybody out there that's dealt with Eric, he teaches the Wednesday trading room uh, with infinity and really nice guy. Sometimes people say nice things. If you guys say mean things, I won't repeat it. Um, no, I still would. I'd probably make, yeah, Eric is awesome. I'd probably make fun of him a whole bunch uh, and say, look, everybody's trashing you. They said, I love exceptional guy. Eric is the man. Somebody should say something mean so I can repeat it to him. Anyway, Eric is the best. That, uh, can you explain how to actually use the 14 day rental of your residence for the accountable plan? Um, yeah, if we have time, I'll get into it. We, we teach that stuff all the time. I'm going to give you an opportunity, by the way, to do a whole bunch of tax stuff. We do have the tax toolbox that came out and I just taught tax wise one week ago today, which is, uh, recorded and we'll give you that recording if you do the uh, tax toolbox. So I'll give you guys the link to that here before the end. Uh, and you'll get all the tax Tuesdays for next year, not tax Tuesdays, the tax wise workshops. I'm going to mm -hmm. do two next year. Yeah. Usually uh, early in the year and then at the end of the year. Uh, and so once we have a chance to digest what's going to happen in the presidential election and all the changes, we'll have the, uh, we'll have that tax wise and you guys will get to that and it's recording. Uh, so we'll get in this. Uh, I just did a quick search and I find the Infinity Investing. Yeah, do the, the Infinity Investing Workshop is what I teach on the 19th. And if you become basic member, which is free, you get the trading room. So, Barb, let Patty give you all that information. Uh, it's called a married put. Eric is very informative. So you guys are learning stuff that I don't know. Uh, anyway, we'll get going. Uh, can you explain how passive activity losses from depreciation are used against the tax liability on the sale of the same passive income asset? Well, I'm, I'm going to take the depreciation out of it um, because your, your passive activity losses come from all your expenses against your income. Plus depreciation. Plus depreciation. So when, when you sell a property, even though that property may be generating passive income or, or passive losses, uh, the sale 
of the property releases all of those suspended losses, all those passive suspended losses. Um, the other thing it does is if you have a gain on the sale of that property, that gain is also considered to be passive. Uh, so let's say you have two properties, they both have losses suspended in them just sitting there. When you sell one of the properties at a gain, you can actually offset the losses of the other property with the gain from the property you sold. Mm hmm. You say it well. I knew you wanted to, but you're so concise. Can you say that in 10 minutes? <laughs> that's, that's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. And so the, the, the big thing to remember is that passive losses offset passive gains. There's a few exceptions. The exceptions are active participation in real estate, real estate professional status, or when you get rid of the asset, like, like Jeff just said. Yeah, the, the really thing, the only thing that depreciation does um, is we talk about depreciation recapture. Uh, that's not additional income. That just changes how the capital gain is taxed. Mm -hmm. Rather than at the lower rates, it might be at a higher twenty-eight percent rate. Or yep, bunch of questions. You guys are questions. Carry back net operating losses under the CARES Act. The CARES Act allows a five-year carry back. Yada, yada, yada. Will 2020 passive investor K-1 loss from multifamily investment be able to be uh, used to offset 2017, 2020 gains? Um, no, because it's passive. It's not an operating loss. Net operating loss means active loss. So the only way that your net operating loss uh, or that your passive losses could be a net operating loss is if you're a real estate professional. Can it offset capital gains? A net operating loss can. Can it offset passive rental gain? Again, you're using passive rental gain in, in, in conjunction with passive income. Gain is capital gain, loss is passive or active or ordinary. So we're using some, some terms that are terms of art. So what, what I think you mean is, if I have rental losses or rental income, can I use uh operating losses against those yes you can use passive loss against those so if i have one property that makes gain or uh, income so i have two rentals one that turns a profit and one that loses money i can use the loss from from the rental against the gain of the other rental or the income from the other rental now he's got me doing it i'm saying gain <laughs> it's like it, I mean, really simply, if you have a net operating loss, you have to carry it back five years. So if it's in 2020, you have to carry it back first to 2015. Mm -hmm. And that you don't have to. You don't have to. Operating loss. I could choose to carry it forward. Oh, you could choose. True. Sure. Yeah. But if, if you did want to carry it back, you have to carry it back the five years. Mm -hmm. uh, and it can offset any kind of income that you have. And then somebody says, is there a limit to how many years the net operating loss can be carried forward? It's in, yeah, it's indefinite now. It's indefinite, right? You have no um, limitation. I believe after 2020, uh, any losses generated in 2021 going forward, go back to the 80% limitation that you can, the, your tax, your taxable income can only be offset by 80% of the income. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they gave, was or, that, I didn't say that quite right. Was that CARES Act? The operating the law. Care, CARES carry, Act. Carry forward. Yeah. Yeah. That was a TCJA change. Mm-hmm. All right. Some of you guys are trying to get into the mastermind portal. You have to sign up uh, first before you can sign on. I've never had so many people just try to go and do the infinity. We're like, we weren't going to really talk about it today, guys. So uh, we will absolutely... Um, carry forwards change under the Biden tax laws. They have all sorts of proposals out there that Biden has that uh, would change things, including this one, by the way. He wants to get rid of 1031 exchanges. Uh, I did a 1031 exchange to buy a condo, which I rented, at, rented for two years. This March, I moved into it. Easier to rent the single family home we were in than the condo. It's now my primary residence. I want to put it in an irrevocable trust. What are the tax implications of doing this? There are none. Right. In fact, under the Garden St. Germain Act, they can't call the note due, and there's no tax consequences, uh, except in Pennsylvania, 
And it depends on the type of living trust. That's the only exception because Pennsylvania is evil. And I grew up there, so I'm allowed to say that. Look at this. Somebody just wrote us a book that took up the I entire screen. Don't write us a book. We can't read it. <laughs> Somebody wrote a thing that took up half the page. I love it. I have to use the elderly font and that gets to be I, I pages long. I can't read it. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Uh, it's all about this stuff. This is fun. <laughs> I'm not going to get into this. Um, oh, I just got... All right, so it's now my primary residence. I want to put it, okay, what are the tax implications of doing this there or not? When I go to sell, will it still be treated as a rental and I'll pay capital gains or will my years of living there impact the ratio? The years of living there are going to impact your ratio, assuming that you live in it two of the five years. And as your primary residence, then the proportion of the time that you live there uh, would dictate what portion of the either two hundred fifty thousand or five hundred thousand dollar capital gains exclusion you'd get. So I wish there was an easy answer. What they have is non qualified use and qualified use. In the unqualified portion, we'd have to look at the proportionality as to how much of the capital gain exclusion you'd get. So if you have a capital gain exclusion of five hundred thousand and half of the time was qualified use, it's 250000 So if you have $200,000 a gain, you don't pay any gain. Uh, there's also, if you move before the two years, and there's a reason that qualifies, you might get portion. What if you live there for five years? It doesn't matter. They, they look at the two of the two years versus five years. You're still, it, it gets kind of poopy when you have uh, rental, rental properties that become primaries. And then you also have depreciation recapture right. because the 121 exclusion only offsets capital gains. Um, good questions, guys. And mean a good good question. I didn't mean to. Sometimes I worry them. Sometimes I'm short. I'm reading three or four things at the same time. How long is the infinity invent? It's uh, nine to five. And by the way, you will love it. I love the infinity event because we get to just dive into making money and I get to grab Eric usually comes on. Aaron usually comes on sometimes Travis, sometimes Hans. We haven't had Hans yet. He's hilarious. Mm -hmm. and I've known him for 20 years and he kicks butt. Um, so we always bring a whole bunch of cool people on and there's nothing to buy. You know, it used to be that the, the basic membership was, uh, was nine ninety five a year. Now it's then we went to nine ninety five a month, and now we've gotten it down to zero, which is our goal four years ago when we started up. All right, uh, my employer sent back a portion of the previous year's four hundred one k contribution to comply with IRS rules for highly compensated employees. In other words, they don't have a safe harbor in their plan of a match, so. You can't have a out of balance plan. The people that make too much money, one hundred twenty thousand dollars and above, or owners. Uh, I think that's the rule. Is it one hundred twenty? It might be higher now, but yeah, it's, this is a top heavy plan, obviously. Yeah, so they return the balance, and so the way the return of the balance works is it's income in the year received, not a, a, a sneaky way of having you get hit with tax for last year. So if this was for 2019 and they said, oh, we were top heavy. So we're going to return some of the money to you. And they did that in 2020. You're paying tax in 2020 on that. And you have the opportunity to offset it through other things. Um, that yeah, makes sense? This, yeah, they actually have to return your excess contribution plus any gains that went with it. Yep. And it's kind of weird, but they have to give you that money. And it's all taxable. <laughs> yeah, it's ordinary income too. Right. So they just say, hey, you have to pay tax on this. So let's say that you put in yeah, $15,000 and then they say, oh, you too much. We have to give you back 3,000 plus, we're gonna give you three fifteenths, what is that, one fifth of the gain that was made and it made $300 that we're gonna add to it. So we're gonna give you back whatever amount it is, um, and you're gonna pay tax the year you receive that back. So when they send it back the previous years, don't worry, you're not getting nailed, but also you can't just put that into another, into your QRP. What you could do is contribute that 
assuming you, 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 you meet the requirements into an IRA, but you're not going to be able to protect that gain. That yeah, means. being a highly compensated employee, uh, you're not going to be able to put it in an IRA, a traditional IRA. Yeah, you're above that. Yeah. So, so time to think of other things. There's lots of other things. Um, I'm not going to go through all these questions. There's so many and they're so long. Let's see. How is deferred income compensation treated when you leave employment? Deferred income. Uh, when you leave employment, well, you got to check your deferral agreement because a lot of them require that you stay with your employer or that at least you have a non-compete. If it's non-compete, then it should be treated underneath the plan, whatever it is normally. <laughs> A lot of deferred income, like California employees, for example, California taxes it in California when you receive it, even if you move to Texas. People are going to learn that next year and the year after because they all fled. They either went to here, to Vegas, or they went to Montana or Idaho or, or Texas, apparently. Yeah, most, most often I see the non-qualified deferred compensation. It's reported on Form W-2 like your wages would have been. Mm -hmm. There's no... Uh, old age survivor disability taken out of it but uh it would be taxed as ordinary income much like your w-2 wages were yeah somebody just asked a really good question too to calculate expenses associated uh with an administrative office in a residence so that the, your employer or your management company is going to reimburse you uh, a percentage of the usable square feet so she says to calculate the expenses associated with the administrative office, is it appropriate to calculate the percentage of space my office occupies within the house of livable space? Yeah, absolutely. So I don't need to worry about hallways, stairs, and closets, not sure to include bathrooms. Yeah, it's usable square footage and it's net square footage type thing. And I'd include bathrooms, but I think you exclude all the hallways and the closets those types of things, stairways mm -hmm. you'd exclude. Uh, somebody keeps telling me to use the whiteboard. No. Don't uh, no, tell them to use the whiteboard. I'll start doing it. Yeah, I would. Um, home sells for a profit of $500,000 after two years. I'm splitting the profits 50-50. How do I avoid paying tax on the entire profit? There's a couple of way to go, ways of going about this. One way is to actually have it paid out to uh, whoever the other 50% is getting right at closing. Yeah. And then in which case it wouldn't be, it, it would be ordinary income to them mm -hmm. and you would deduct it against your profit. So it's just like paying somebody uh, interest in, in essence. Uh, you're most likely going to have to report it. You put it on schedule D or the form 89, 49, it goes with schedule D. Uh, and you actually will say, who got the other 50 percent what their social security number was yep now if this is a house that you lived in so let's say that this is your personal residence and you're looking for the uh, capital gains exclusion you have to live in it two years and you have to be on title and with a few exceptions like when somebody passes or in divorce mm -hmm. but it, let's just say that you're there with you know, your partner or your best friend or somebody else. And you, you were always like, hey, I bought it, but we'll split the profit 50 50. You may have a capital gain exclusion of 250,000. You're giving them 250,000. They don't. So you don't pay tax on it. They may pay tax on their portion. Uh, for significant others, Unmarried significant others, does that present its own problems if they're both living there, but only one person is on title? Yes, absolutely. It, it, it's the same as hold truths for married couples. You know, when you get married, they're going to, it is, they're going to assume that that one spouse can relate to the other. But if you're not married and it's just cohabitation, then it, it that's the problem. They're going to lose out on the capital gain exclusion. And then it has to be after they do get married. The period of non-married doesn't count towards the two years for each person has to qualify. So people always think, oh, I'll get married and then we get a $500,000 exclusion. It doesn't work that way. You had to have lived there for two years. 
No, oh, well. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, yes. Uh, somebody says on that uh, previous question about the administrative office in the home, um, what about the number of room methodology? Yes, you could use any reasonable basis for, for getting that percentage. Um, somebody says, what should I what should I have my kids do to join? Oh, if they're going to do infinity, have them jump on in. Uh, Patty will give you the link. And by the way, I've done the infinity teachings to under, I think we did an under 25 one. We mm-hmm. have a lot of teenagers in there. We have a few that crush it. Um, the infinity stuff again, is a lot of fun. It's easy, but for, for the guys that are techno savvy, it's like a video game. Eric's really good on the charts. So they're really good at this and they get tend to get it. Um, all right. Actions you may want to take in before the end of the year, just so you know, uh, if you have any losses, then you're going to harvest, uh, some gain. Or if you're, if you're married filing jointly and listen, listen very carefully to what I'm about to tell you guys, if you're married filing jointly and you're below $80,000, and I will use the little whiteboard on this one. Some of you guys like that. If you're $80,000, or below. And by the way, I'm going to say $80,000 of taxable income. Because this is after your deductions. In your standard deduction, for example, if you're married filing jointly is 24800 without having to think about anything else. If you're at $80,000 and you have the standard deduction, that means you have capital gains and i should say long term capital gains 0% for that 24000 so if you have gains and you want to recognize them this year that will bring you up to that $80,000 limit you could sell and buy it right back you sell it and buy it right right back. And the reason that you do that is because there's no such thing as a wash sale gain rule. It's only on losses. So you go ahead and you immediately take your gain for long term and that will pump your basis up so that when you sell it later, your basis is now adjusted to the higher amount. And the reason you do that is so you're pushing that up and using up as much of your zero bracket. What annoys the heck out of Jeff is when you have somebody who's making $40,000 and they have unrealized gains of $30,000 sitting and they're looking at it going, why the hell didn't you just sell it and buy it back? You would have mm-hmm. been at zero tax. And then they wait and the next year they're at, you know, they're making 70,000 and they sell the thing and they have, $40,000 a gain that now is all taxed at 15%. So, um, yeah, in the, the capital gain itself is included in the 80,000 for the income level, just for determining the long-term capital gains, but it doesn't raise your tax level. So like it's not going to push you up into a higher tax bracket. Um, other thing is Roth conversions. This is misunderstood. If your tax bracket is going to go up in the future, Roth conversions make sense. If your tax bracket is going to go down in the future, like when you retire, they do not make sense. So if you are in the 32 plus, even 24 plus tax bracket, do not convert your Roth into a Roth you're causing yourself problems the math doesn't work. So, you know, like just telling you a hundred percent adjusted gross income is for cash donations. You can donate cash to your charity, to somebody else's charity. Oops. Cash donation. Uh, donate. This is a good year to donate. <laughs> you don't have a 60% adjusted gross income. So, uh, you can get yourself down to zero. Remember your uh, net operating losses. You have the opportunity to carry them back five years. But if Biden gets in, um, if that's, that appears to be the case, then without making any political statement, 
his proposals are to increase taxation, the, the, the top tax brackets to 39.6, your top uh, capital gains rates to 39.6, uh, corporate taxes to 28% to increase and add the uh, old age disability and survivors insurance to folks over 100,000 again. Um, so we want to make sure that we carry forward instead of doing the carry back no carry back because your carry forwards are going to be worth more uh, and you may you may want to wait on harvesting losses if you have losses you may want to wait until january in case capital gains go up in that way it'll offset a higher amount and then obviously if if, if we're worried about losing the step up in basis and you have a huge amount of um net or uh, amount that you can give underneath the federal exclusion uh, the capital the exclusion for the state tax exclusion and the gift tax exclusion you have huge amounts maybe it's time to consider gifting those especially if you're in a very uh if you have a sizable estate because if you lose the ability if you could have given away two point or th uh, 23 million dollars yeah. and you lose that and it becomes two million you're going to be kicking yourself because that's a 40%. Of course, it, you're, you pass away, so you're not going to be able to kick yourself. You're going to be passed away. But your kids or whoever you leave behind might be ticked off because they say, wait a second, we got to pay 40% on $20 million when mm -hmm. we could have avoided it entirely. Mom, I know you're passed, but I'm really mad at you. Yeah, anyway. I'm not going to say anything distasteful, but that is pretty funny. Uh, last thing, uh, just the value of Roths and traditionals over, over a regular taxable account. It's always a good idea to get money into a tax deferred vehicle. On the traditional uh, and the Roth side, you can always make your contributions early next year. Um, and the charitable giving, this is all the rules on charitable giving. The only reason I throw that up there is the cash, the HEIA limitation this year went from 60% to 100%. That's the only portion. Uh, corporations can give 25% of net income this year. It's usually 10%. Uh, yay. So this is the time to give. Last thing is the tax toolbox. If you do want to do the tax toolbox, there's the link. It's $595. This will walk you through a lot of this. I cut a video for the end of year. It's about, um, I don't know, 25 minutes or so, just going through stuff for end of the year. It's $595, um, 495 if you want just the E version. And then the, 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 the bonus, bonus is tax-wise recording, the one we just did on 12.1 plus, next year's two uh two tax wise uh it says net year that's just next year we're going to add all those things so anyway so the tax toolbox makes a wonderful christmas gift it makes a it makes a wonderful festivus gift so for festivus for the rest of us oh, yeah you remember that festivus Jeff, here's your Festivus gift. I'm going to give you a tax toolbox. Thank you. Um, and there's your tax wise. The tax wise, uh, the recording was from 12 1. All right. If you like the podcast, you like the Tax Tuesdays, you want to go, who's giving me angry faces or are those crying faces? Some of you guys remember Festivus. Good old Seinfeld. Um, so how about all those who already purchased can we get gifted next year's you are funny jim i think you already got it i think you got all this year's and all the recordings um if you twist our arms we probably will give it to you jim just because it's the holiday season as long as you go and use it by the way i've been collecting the testimonials on uh tax wise and the people that use it save a ton of money i was kind of pleasantly surprised that we had a lot of Fifty thousand and sixty thousand dollar savings in there from people that went to tax wise, and I always tell them just pick three strategies every time you go through it and do little bite sized pieces. Uh, is avail is tax wise available in the platinum portal? No, it's not. 
But uh, somebody says it should be. <laughs> what are you talking about? Ta oh, wait, tax-wise, maybe. In the, um, the toolbox is not, so I don't know. Uh, somebody says, I paid for tax-wise. Can I just do the difference? Yeah, you can do the difference. I don't care, you guys. Uh, somebody says twisting really hard. Um, is there a difference between e-version and non-e-version? It's just physical. It's literally, it's a really nice box and it's got a nice workbook and you get a USB. Otherwise, we're just giving it all in the electronic format. There's not a big difference. Um, some people like having the stuff and put it on their shelves. So uh, podcasts, go in there and look at all of our podcasts. There's a lot of really cool ones. And uh, we also put the Tax Tuesdays in there. Replays should be in your platinum porthole, 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 porthole. I've lived on a boat for a couple of years. <laughs> I can say porthole. Uh, there's what it looks like in iTunes, and that's what it looks like in Google Play. And then if you have any other tax questions, by all means, send them in. We get hundreds per week. Our guys are really good about answering them. I go through there, and I always grab a handful of questions. I literally go through and grab ones that I haven't seen or that seem really cool, or I just grab 10 in a row and then Jeff gets mad at me because it ends up being 20. I come in here and say, what the heck? Yeah, because we're supposed to do these in an hour and we're, we're almost to the hour. <laughs> Which one? You didn't say <laughs> first hour, second hour. It's close. We're 11 minutes early on this hour. So, guys, uh, if we don't hear from you, have a ho great holiday season. Happy Christmas. Uh, happy Hanukkah. Uh, Kwanzaa or whatever you might be celebrating. Just know that uh, it's been a heck of a year. Heck of a year. So we want to make sure that we are uh, doing everything we can for those who are struggling during the holiday season. I know you guys are giving people. I will say this. Um, it was uh, Andrew Carnegie. If you guys have been through Infinity, you know that I always give you guys the uh, the, the gospel of wealth, that uh, millionaires really are trustees of the poor. And no time more than right now is it pretty serious that there's folks out there that are having food shortage, having uh, all sorts of uncertainty during the holiday season. So do what you can to help out those people in your local community. We don't need government to do that. They suck at doing a lot of things. They're, they're good at some things, but... There's a lot of things, and one of those things is really reaching people that we see on a daily basis that may be in struggling. And so just do what you can. Make as much money as you, as you can because you, maybe you're really good at it and other people are bad at it. And, uh, and, and, and help those people out. It might just be a gift card. It might just be being nice to them. But uh, God knows it's been a divisive year, and hopefully mm -hmm. we can uh, recover from it. So, uh, so from both of us, or Jeff, you can say your own piece. No, I just – it's been a rough year for everybody and looking forward to next year. And Heck yeah. So, you know, so hopefully you're getting the tax stuff settled where you realize that taxes aren't uh, a source of anxiety. They should be a source of interest and joy. It's like a puzzle. When you start going into it, you start realizing, wow, the tax code really is pretty awesome. The things that it gives us opportunities to do and, and rewards are great on the same token it's a really big stick when it hits you. And so we want to see it coming. We don't want to be surprised by that stick and it's a slow moving stick. So usually you have a chance to get out of the way. Uh, if you know what you're doing, there's lots of stuff. Uh, some of you guys are asking still questions about the, the 14 day rental. I actually do in the tax toolbox, go into it. We also do it in our tax and asset protection events. We have one coming up on Saturday on the 12th. You will hear about it there. So I would suggest that if you want to dive into it, uh, the, the, the best way is to go under our website, go under YouTube, uh, or go to the class on Saturday. I believe Michael and Carl are teaching it. Uh, it should be free. Uh, Patty might be able to get you that, uh, that, that login or that uh, access code. It'll be Zoom, and, uh, and you will. So uh, anyway. Hope everybody has a great holiday season and uh, maybe, maybe Santa will bring you a cop, your own copy of the tax code uh, for <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> All right, guys, have a great one. Mm -hmm.